thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink, thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own, into our house enter thou not, through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hey, Dan. I'm Lindsay. Oh, okay. Nice to meet you, Lindsay. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> uh, episode 94 of Scared to Death and feeling extra inspired for horror right now. Been reading some uh, H.P. Lovecraft this week. Is it episode 94? It is episode 94. Huh. In my brain, it was episode 93. Oh, you I know what? I labeled as 93. I think it is episode oh, 93. Oh, jeez. I had it written down wrong. Ay, ay, ay. I was working, in my defense, I was working on episode 94 and 93, back and forth, back and forth, and uh, carried one over to the other. Don't now, worry, guys. We're only on 93. You didn't <laughs> miss something. There's not the, like, <sighs> the missing tapes of Scared to Death. Now I had to look forward. I'm like, is this the right stories for it? It is. It is. <laughs> That's okay. When we, when you were, uh, when the intro was playing, I I was like, yeah. oh, uh, ha ha, I forgot to uh, write an intro for my second story. I know what it's about, but I yeah. have like a formula that I use and I didn't write the right thing down. It's been a little extra chaotic, I feel like, just life-wise lately. I'm like, we have a lot of little things behind the scenes and I, I've had to struggle more than normally. Be like, wait, what am I working on right yes. now? Yes, yes. And then just weird, like, behind-the-scene tech stuff. Yeah. Some, of, some of it was happening right before the recording, and it's been going on for weeks, and it's so irritating. Like, yeah. I feel like it interrupts my thoughts It does, constantly. it does, and it's it's minute, but mm -hmm. somehow it feels so very big. And I was actually just talking to a couple of my girlfriends about this because yeah. I thought, like, God, what is going on? Is it me? Is mm -hmm. it, like, as a parent, especially as the parent who is the more flexible schedule? Yeah. You know, then you're, like, worried about, like, the kids in the summer. What are we going to do? And are we going here? Are we going... And you just... I, I actually hate the summer huh. because we have kids. Yeah. If we didn't have kids, I'd be like, fuck yeah, bro. It's always summer. <laughs> but like, it is really hard yeah. with kids, you know, because there's, it's just a different. Keeping them occupied. Yeah. It's a different kind of stress and pressure. And then like, you're trying to take a family vacation, but then you have to get ahead at work and blah, 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 blah. And so I think everyone, everyone I talk to is feeling it. And, and because things are opening back up so much. Right. It's a sudden like influx. Yeah. You know, it's like how everything just abruptly stopped and it made everyone like, whoa, what is happening? Mm -hmm. Then we got now used it's the reverse. To, well, we got used to a certain kind of living and now, yes, it is the reverse. True. Mm -hmm. True. And Mercury is in retrograde. Okay. Well, <laughs> I love how that gets zero credit. Uh, in, in addition to being frazzled, uh, also very excited for horror right now. I love that um, theaters are back open I in a lot know. of places, including here. We just saw a Quiet Place too. I made it. Yep, you made it. You thought it was very scary. But I you enjoyed loved it. it. I forgot. It was actually a great like reintroduction to horror movies for mm -hmm. me. I mean, I know that we do the This Looks Awesome movie club, but this was the first time like in a theater, and there's something about it, and I was like, oh yeah, I fucking love being scared. Yeah, it was. It was a good one. It's really good and I didn't necessarily care for the first one right but I will say in my defense I think the reason I didn't care about the first one is my defense mechanism on horror movies is to be like oh whatever oh I saw that coming because I, if I don't let myself get too invested mm. or too into the movie then I'm not scared Did you, so you relax more for this one yes well good job it was great. I loved it. I jumped so much. <laughs> I've been listening to, uh, uh, in addition to reading some of his stuff, I've been listening to some H.P. Lovecraft, too, on, like, oh. uh, audiobooks in, like, in the in the truck. Yeah. And it's just, um, you know, it's older, but mm -hmm. it's just a nice, real spooky, creepy vibe. So, yeah. So, I'm excited <laughs> to tell today's tales. I'm also listening to an audiobook from a dead man. Mm. But I'm reading, I'm listening to an Anthony, Anthony Bourdain book. Very different. Very different. <laughs> but he was naughty. Uh, super fun new merch collection in the store at badmagicmerch.com this week. The Eat, Drink, and Be Scary collection. Funny. Well done, Logan. Uh, super fun and clever. We're having a, a cooking apron, t-shirt, two different coffee mugs, and a really cool vacuum-sealed tumbler mm -hmm. in the store. And post picks if you get any of these items and you use them or wear them. Hashtag your picks, eat, drink, and be scary on Facebook or Instagram, and then we can you know find them and repost them. Oh, that's fun. That's yeah. a good idea. Very clever. And a quick donation reminder, Bad Measure Productions, thanks entirely to our Patreon supporters. Proud to donate 20% of all subscriptions, 14100 this month, with half going to Trin Trinity Stables in Georgia. Mm -hmm. They run a weekly mentorship program that utilizes equine-assisted learning to better prepare foster and adopted kids for healthy transitions into adulthood. You can go to trinitystables.net for more info. 
Other half of the donation goes to Vintage Pet Rescue, a Rhode Island-based nonprofit committed to rescuing vintage, a.k.a. senior pets, from shelters and assisting their owners who can no longer care for their vintage pets. So you can go to VintagePetRescue.org for that one. I don't always get to talk to the people that we're donating to. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just a bigger business or what have you. But both of these, I got to talk to the people who run them. Mm -hmm. And they're just so happy and they're so grateful. It's like I could have given them a dollar and they would have been like, thank you so much. Because Uh, just talking about it helps because other people find them and their services. And uh, it feels so good. So thank you for giving us that opportunity, like especially since I handle that. Nothing makes me happier than contacting them and saying like hey this is what you're getting and you can just feel the appreciation so i love it thanks for letting us do that Mm -hmm. and now it is story time how many stories do you have for us today well i'll tell you in a second it's almost story time it's almost story time i'm so sorry okay okay can i tell you one other thing yeah okay so i I noticed recently because i check into like the facebook instagram people are like okay what were those other podcasts what are dan and Lindsay? like what else would they recommend and so if you're looking for some extra spoops i did want to tell you that box of oddities is Mm -hmm. so fucking great it's such a great show married couple Mm -hmm. right cat and jethro Mm -hmm. yep Mm -hmm. yeah and so so it's they're very cool and um you know nothing is off limits for them. Yeah, they have a cool fan base, the uh freak family. Cute. You know, they call their listeners and yeah, they really have a, like a, a strong sense of community with their show like we do with ours. Yeah. And yeah, and they just cover such a fun variety of topics, you know, uh medical oddities to abandoned funeral homes. It's just a very fun show and it's fun to see some of our our friends in the horror space doing well with the show. Yeah, because it's horror and comedy. So there is like a carryover mm-hmm. from us, so it's it's funny and actually this year they won a Webby Award, which is actually wow, a big awesome. deal. It's not yeah. an easy thing to do. Um, we didn't win, so uh. <laughs> but we're happy to see our friends doing well. And actually, like Jimmy Kimmel recently said something like, uh, you know, if if you're interested in the what did he say? Oh, uh, oh, if you're somebody who is interested in weird stuff, oh yeah, you'll, yeah, yeah. you'll love this show. Um, so you know, you can you can catch Box of Oddities wherever you get your podcast. Give Jethro and Cat some love. We love them. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've we've never met them in person, but we have been in contact for a long time now, and I just super dig them. Ah, excited to see them do well. So yeah. it's fun to support a uh, another fun show. And I have two stories. Okay. Okay. So I have a weird story about like missing time, possibly. Okay. Which is not anything I think I've ever told in a fan story. And then I have a weird psychic story that I okay. think I think it's psychic. All right. Very cool. Because I, I can give credit to that kind of stuff. Uh, I have my normal two stories. The the first is kind of three, actually, because the first is really two stories in one. Okay. It begins with an old British ghost story. Ooh. The Hammersmith ghost uh, leads to a murder, and then that murder leads to a haunting that leads to a creepy modern encounter tale. I, d- I dig that. And then uh, we go to India and learn about a monster we haven't talked about here before, the Pishaka, a Hindu flesh-eating demon. Hmm. I have a story coming up because I've had to work ahead on the book. Oh, man, it's not that, but it's another, like, Middle Eastern hmm. thing that I had never heard of that is going to fuck you up. Well, and this one's India. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. I was in the wrong, sorry, I was yeah. in the wrong country. They're all, it's me, I don't know geography, if you guys don't know that. <laughs> so it's like, India, yeah. China, they're side by side, right? Australia? Like, I just can't picture it. <laughs> uh, you're, you're, yeah, heading in the right direction. You're heading in the right direction. That's very nice of you. I was sort of headed in the right direction. Okay, heading to Hammersmith when you're ready. I am ready. Let's do it. Starting in November 1803, the British citizens of Hammersmith were worried about the typical concerns of daily life we all still worry about. Money, health, taxes, family squabbles, neighborhood crime, etc. They were also worried about something out of this world. They worried that something paranormal was going to attack them like it had allegedly already attacked some of their neighbors. Today, Hammersmith is a district just west of London, England. Back in 1803, the same locality was its own parish lying within the now obsolete suburban district of Ostelstone in the historic county of Middlesex. The parish of Hammersmith would become immortalized in Charles Dickens' Great Expectations as home of the poor Pocket family. The main character, Pip, resides with the Pockets in their house by the river. Before Dickens' wildly popular novel introduced Hammersmith to millions around the world, the area was already locally famous for a violent spirit, the Hammersmith Ghost. According to local lore, the spirit was the ghost of a local man who'd recently committed suicide. And then he'd been buried in the Hammersmith churchyard, which according to the beliefs of the times, opened a door to spiritual trouble. There was a belief that suicide victims should not be buried in consecrated ground as both a deterrent to the living to not also take their own life, but also because their souls were believed to be restless. 
uh, restless. The ghosts of suicide deaths were considered susceptible to demonic control and therefore dangerous to place near the congregation. Crossroads were often the chosen place of burial for suicide victims, a place chosen to confuse the spirit of the restless victim. The choice of four converging paths would not allow the spirit to pick a place to wander, was the belief. And the Hammersmith's ghost was believed to be one of these restless and also probably demonic spirits. Sightings in Hammersmith were frequent, and they'd worked up the locals into a terrified state. Time now for the tale of the Hammersmith ghost. For weeks, those walking through Hammersmith at night kept catching a glimpse of a strange being, who they usually described as unnaturally tall and as being dressed all in white. Sometimes, curiously, the entity was also described as wearing what looked like some sort of calfskin cloak, horns with unnaturally large glass eyes. If a witness were lucky, a glimpse was all they'd get before they made it away from the creature back to the safety of their homes. Some wouldn't be so lucky. It seemed like this ghost didn't just want to linger, it wanted to hurt. In December, a pregnant woman taking a shortcut home to the churchyard was chased by a spectral figure that she described as being very tall and very white. She was able to describe it well because it didn't just chase her, it caught her. And when it grabbed her in its arms, she fainted. Later, her friends found her wandering aimlessly around the cemetery. She was gently led home and put to bed. Supposedly, she never recovered from the shock of this incident and actually died shortly thereafter. Whoa. And then this happened again to another woman who was elderly. Once again, this woman is said to have literally died from the shock days later. The spirit, according to old accounts, seemed to have been actually scaring people to death. Both women were described as being in perfect health before their encounters. They suffered from no illnesses and weren't believers in the paranormal. People who saw their corpses reported that they still had looks of terror on their faces, eyes frozen in wide, horrified stares, lingering for hours after their deaths. And there were additional direct encounters. A brewer's servant, Thomas Groom, said while walking to the churchyard with a companion one night, close to 9 p.m., something rose from behind a tombstone and seized him by the throat. Hearing the scuffle, his companion turned around, at which the ghost gave me a twist round and I saw nothing. I gave a bit of a push out with my fist and felt something soft, he said. Thomas considered himself lucky to escape with his life. Thomas was not the first to fight back against what he believed to be a ghost. On December 29, 1804, William Girdler, a night watchman, saw the ghost while near Beaver Lane and chased after it. Before being able to grab it, he said the ghost vanished into thin air directly in front of him. With London having no organized police force at the time, and due to many people who were very much frightened, Girdler was one of many Hammersmith residents who decided to form their own police force of sorts. Several citizens formed armed patrols in hopes of apprehending the ghost. All of this, the fear, the supposed attacks, and the armed patrols, would converge with a style of work uniform that happened to be in fashion locally at the time into an extremely tragic and unfortunate murder. All white clothes happened to be the garments most often worn by some local bricklayers. Oh, no. Including one Thomas Millwood. After several people were startled by encountering him at night during the height of the Hammersmith ghost frenzy, his wife asked him to wear something different so no more people would think he was the Hammersmith ghost. He should have listened. As one witness would later state in court, it was an extreme dark night in January of 1804. That night, an, ex, uh, an, uh, an officer named Francis Smith decided he was going to look for Hammersmith's ghost, and he took a shotgun with him to do so. Smith was patrolling just as Thomas Millwood was making his way home late at night by the Black Lion, by the Black Lion Lane. On spotting him, Smith called out, Who are you and what are you? And then, without waiting for an answer, amped up on fear, paranoia, paranoia and adrenaline, he fired his gun. And when he then heard the subsequent groan and saw the blood, it immediately became clear to him that he had shot not a ghost, but a man. And he took Millwood to the nearby Black Lion pub in search of a doctor. And Millwood would die before he found one. Smith would confess to the proper authorities to shooting Millwood, telling them he genuinely believed him to be a ghost. He then went on trial for willful murder at the Old Bailey later that year. And his jury had to answer a curious question. Is thinking someone was a ghost a legitimate defense for murder? In their view, it was, and they returned a verdict of manslaughter rather than murder. The judge was not happy with his decision, though, and renounced their verdict, stating that Smith believing Millwood to be a ghost should not be considered a factor in determining his guilt. The jury was told, deliberate again and either convict him outright or clear him of murder altogether. They then delivered a guilty verdict on the most serious charge, and Smith was initially condemned to death, but his sentence would be quickly reduced to just a year in prison with hard labor. 
clearly many believed that thinking he'd shot a ghost was a legitimate defense, which speaks to the strength of supernatural beliefs in Hammersmith at the time. The Hammersmith's ghost was now gone, and clearly, it may have never existed in the first place. Ever since, though, many think that Francis Smith's fear of the Hammersmith ghost created a real and equally angry spirit. According to locals, Thomas Millwood, the unfortunate bricklayer that Smith murdered, has haunted the Black Lion pub where his body was taken after being shot ever since he died there. The pub has experienced a whole host of supernatural activity that has included lighting problems, beer barrels moving around on their own, a mysterious mist that often appears around midnight and violently rattles the doors. Pub drinkers have heard their names whispered, computers have turned themselves on, the upstairs floorboards can be heard creaking in the distinct manner that speaks to someone walking across them, and then there are the mirrors in the hallway that lead to the restroom, or to use the local term, the loo. People have claimed to have seen the ghost of Thomas in these mirrors, and the sight has terrified them. One such witness is a former employee, briefly employed at the Hammersmith Ghost, uh, briefly employed by the pub, who went by the initial C on a forum where he posted his experience from back in 2013. And here is C's story. When he reported for his first day at work, C was surprised to find out what he expected to, or that he was expected to sign a legal document agreement, saying that anything that happened to him on the property was not the pub's fault. He thought that was a bit odd, but it didn't keep him from taking the job. He assumed that maybe the owners had just had one too many experiences with drunks taking swings at employees and employees using the opportunity to sue. After he quit, he would assume that the waiver had nothing to do with customers and everything to do with a spirit. His first night at the Black Lion, he still assumed it was a normal pub. His manager told him that he was supposed to walk through the hallways to the bathrooms a few times at night to make sure that no one had spilled anything back there. He at first thought nothing of this assigned duty, but then C noticed that there were some beautiful antique mirrors in the hallway to the bathroom, and as soon as he looked at one, his manager grabbed his arm. When you, when you walk back here, she said, I wouldn't look at these mirrors. If you see something, don't scream. We don't need to scare any more of our customers away. C laughed nervously, thinking that his manager was playing some sort of joke on him. Why would I scream, he asked. Just trust me on this one, she said. It's better not to look than to see him. Now he thought that either his manager was playing a joke on him or that she was a bit of a nutter when it came to ghosts. Either way, he didn't worry too much about her advice, and the first night passed normally enough. It was pretty slow, which he didn't mind as he was getting used to things. The next couple of shifts were slow and fine as well. And during these shifts, despite not really being worried about what his manager said, C did actually avoid looking into those mirrors when he walked alone towards the bathroom down the hallway. He glanced around just long enough to see that everything was in its proper place, and then he got back out of there back to the safety of the bar. If he happened to see a little flicker in his peripheral vision, movement coming from the direction of one of those mirrors, he wrote it off as nothing while also refusing to look and investigate. He was embarrassed to admit it, but the manager's strange warning had gotten under his skin a bit. Then on his fourth night shift, something happened that made C think that his manager was neither joking nor a nutter. It was early afternoon on a Tuesday, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, it was uh, on a Tuesday, early in the evening, there we go, uh, very slow, as in dead, not a single customer was in at the moment, and C was looking over at some schoolwork as he stood behind the bar. Across the bar, he heard the door open and felt a slight breeze. Nothing alarming, just another customer coming in for a drink. A regular, he thought, and he marked his place in his book and shut it. Then, when he looked up, no one was there. The bar was empty. Goosebumps erupted on his forearms. Crazy. He swore he'd heard someone come in. Even though he saw, he even thought he saw feet move across the floor as he began to pick up his head from the book, but no one was there. Then, with a roaring sound, the electric dryer started up in the bathroom. Startled, C gasped and jumped, and then laughed at himself. Okay. Now he understood what had happened. A customer had come in and quickly walked down the hall to use the bathroom. He relaxed. Crisis averted. He shook his head over how silly he was acting. The manager had really gotten into his head. C grabbed a clean glass and got ready for the person to come out and place their order. But then after a minute or so, no one came. He waited a few more minutes. Still, no one came out of the bathroom. This made no sense. Hadn't he distinctly heard the sound of the hand dryer? They were motion sensitive, only came on when someone waved their hands underneath them. It was such a distinct sound, he didn't think he could have mistaken it for something else. Someone had to have gone in there, right? And he'd heard that someone open the door. So why were they still in there after drying off their hands? What was the holdup? Should he go check and see if they're okay? 
A deep sense of dread now spread from his stomach to his chest, making his heart beat quickly. He couldn't stop thinking about those damn mirrors. He really wished his manager had never said anything. Why? Why did she say that? What if he walked back there and found no one in the bathroom? What would he tell himself then? He hesitated behind the bar. And then he imagined someone hurt in the bathroom, passed out or something, and he imagined his boss asking him why hadn't he gone in there to help. And he pictured himself saying to his boss that no, he hadn't gone to help the customer trapped in the bathroom because he was worried about a ghost in the mirror. Would he be fired? Or just too embarrassed to ever show up back at work? Fuck, he whispered. He had to go check. Even though everything in his body was telling him to get the hell out of there, carefully he raised the barrier to the bar, propped it up, and then went around to the other side of the bar to the entrance to the hallway. Hello? No answer. He used one hand to knock on the wall, still not wanting to go down the hall. Hello? Still nothing. He now slowly began to walk down the hall, keeping his eyes focused down towards the floor. No way he was going to look at those mirrors now. He decided that he was going to knock again, ask the customer if they needed help, and if there was still no answer, he was going to head in and explore the loo. And if he couldn't find anyone in there, he was going to stay at the bar the rest of his shift, and then he was going to immediately start looking for a new job. One foot after the other, he slowly closed the distance between himself and the bathroom door. Five more steps. Four more. Three. Bang! Back at the bar, the partition slammed down, making a sound like a gun had gone off. C whirled around, momentarily picking his eyes up from the floor, and he found himself staring straight into the mirror. And directly behind him, he saw a dead man. A dead man who was weirdly blurry around the edges. As C watched, frozen and horrified, blood began to pour out of a hole in the man's chest, spattering on the floor, the walls, even against C's clothes. He felt droplets of the blood spatter against the back of his forearms. And that got him moving. C screamed and ran out of the pub, no longer caring if he got fired or if someone broke into the bar or about anything. He just needed to leave. He ran and was about to cross the street when a hand suddenly grabbed his arm. His manager. Ugh. He sighed in relief. Something he started to say, but he didn't have enough air. His lungs felt like they were going to explode. I know, she said. I had a terrible feeling about 20 minutes ago that something was wrong. I got over here as fast as I could. The, the blood, he panted. But as he looked down at his clothes, he saw that there wasn't any blood. His shirt was a little rumpled like normal, but definitely not stained in blood. I told you to not look in the mirror, she said. Come on, let's go lock up. No, he shook his head. No way, I quit. She shrugged as though she'd expected that answer, and C watched her go back and head inside. C said he never went back inside himself, not even to pick up his check. He decided it wasn't worth it. He didn't want to risk hearing or seeing anything again. He was too worried about the man he saw in the mirror. What if that spirit could follow him out of the pub? What if that man suddenly showed up in his own mirror? It took months before C could look into a mirror without experiencing a feeling of dread, worry that suddenly he'd be there again. C still gets worried from time to time, still gets scared. He worries what if he looks up while brushing his teeth before bed, and there he is. The blood spattering all over him again, the feeling of it pressing against his body. Where will he run if this happens at home? My God. I just had this crazy thought, like, mm -hmm. what if you are a spirit and you can just bounce from mirror to mirror, like you're trapped, Ooh. but you can only show up in mirrors. That that's you can, scary. Like, like, you can bounce from them. Right, like it's some parallel kind of world, and that's how you can, you know, you can travel inside it, but not uh -huh. outside of it. Oh. I mean, I guess there'd be some weird comfort if it couldn't come outside of the mirror to well, access you. if you break you. the mirror, then does it get out? All kinds of crazy, spooky thoughts. That would be a really interesting movie. Mm-hmm. The mirror movie. Okay, what you got? I got some pictures. Uh, th Show me. This first one, uh, somewhat recent picture of the Black Lion Pub. <laughs> cool little, you know, uh, classic British pub. Very cute. And then this is a pic of the same pub from the 1880s. It's so a little older pic here. Oh, looks very different. Mm -hmm. It's not even the same shape anymore. Yeah, just remodeling over the years. Yeah. But basic, I mean, but no, I see the, the resemblance. Just, yeah. And then uh, this is an old public domain sketch of the Hammersmith ghost, likely from the early 19th century. Okay. It was a, a, a big media sensation at the time. And then uh, this next one is an engraving of the Hammersmith ghost in Kirby's Wonderful and Scientific Museum, a magazine published in 1804. 1804, wow. Mm -hmm, so they were thinking about it a lot back then. Yeah. And then I tried to find a sketch or something of that poor murdered bricklayer, Thomas Millwood. Yeah. Couldn't find one, but looking through pics of British bricklayers, I did find a photo I thought really funny okay. uh, was of a UK minister, uh, Boris Johnson. 
<laughs> working on some laying bricks. some bricks. Uh huh. And I just I just love when politicians do pictures like this of like, look, I'm a regular guy. Look I, at me. I, I, I'm like you. <laughs> I do the same things that you do. And pretty sure he's not using that trowel right. No, pretty he, sure he's kind of like holding it up and like 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 he's using the handle as a hammer. Uh huh. <laughs> He looks a little Michael Myers esque in that moment, like ah. Yeah, yeah. It's just I just I was like, that's a that's a weird pick. It's like maybe you uh, shouldn't have pretended to know anything about bricklaying. I've never understood that why they do that. I, th- I mean, I know why, but it's right. so dumb because it's, it's like so every dumb. every bricklayer mm-hmm. or firefighter right. or whatever thing that you're pretending to do. Every everyone is like, yeah, you're not doing that right. <laughs> I know. It's so dumb. And it's like, it makes me mad that it must work on some level. Because I'm like, who's falling for that? Right. But like, if I saw some politician, like, he's the podcaster too. And he's like, just do, I'm like, no, he's not. No, he's not. Or but like, whatever. It would you be know? better if they were trying to be a stand-up comedian. He's a stand-up c- comedian. Just like, you know. Just like Dan Cummins. Just like me. It's like, no, he's, no, he's not. No, he's not. But but it, but it is even better when it's like manual labor stuff. I know. And it's like they've never had a, probably like a manual labor job. And they're like, no, I'm just a I'm just out here mending some fence, just like a guy who does that. It's like no, like, no I love that. the hard hat touch. <laughs> oh, like whenever yeah. they have a yep. shovel, mm-hmm. they're in a perfect suit and they have <laughs> right. a little hard hat on. This is how I go to work. <laughs> I'm just going to my shift like it's, everybody else here. It's a little too big and kind of falling <laughs> off the side. <laughs> Uh, I, I find it equally as annoying and frustrating than when they show them actually doing regular things like eating an ice cream cone or going mm-hmm. to eat tacos. And then it's always like, oh, get back to work. It's like, oh, my <laughs> God. Right. Like they can't ever take a second to have a have a meal. Nope. That is another weird thing. I know. Come on. There's still potholes. It's like, why, yeah. are, why are you eating a taco? But but he's trying to talk about like, you know, small business and how it's important. <laughs> and he's at the small business. And then, oh, my God. It just goes to show like everyone is insatiable mm-hmm. when True. it comes to that. True. Yeah. You can't win. You cannot. On the best day, half the world hates you. Right. On your best day. Mm-hmm. That's awful. Yeah. I, I would not be cut out to be a politician. Fuck no. Ugh. Ugh. Um, what did I wrote down? Can you use a ghost? Oh, as your... Okay, the trial thing. I thought mm-hmm. that was kind of interesting. <laughs> Are there other... Uh, you probably don't know this unless you happen to have this little detail in your brain where people have tried to say a ghost was like... Oh, I I thought they were a ghost, so I shot them. Uh, I don't know. The, they've uh, had people try to use, you know, a couple times in the U.S., and I'm sure I'm guessing in other countries, people have used or tried to use uh, a ghost. Oh, I can't think of the case. It was somewhere down in the southeast a long time ago. Where, where it was basically like the ghost was a witness, and the oh. ghost and the ghost came to another person, and that person wanted to testify at the trial. Hey, here's what so and so did because their ghost told me. Uh, and, and actually, the ghost go- made me do it. <laughs> no, it wasn't even. It was just like the ghost told me what happened. The ghost told me who did it. Well, didn't we cover that story? We did. We did. Yeah, that was one of our early That's stories. Different though. No, I know. I'm saying. I'm saying I, there hasn't been what you're exactly you're talking about, but there's been right. things in that kind of realm. Yeah. Salem witch trials. They talked about you know seeing spirits do things in their dreams. And then, like the Amityville, that um, Richard DeFeo, yeah, uh, he tried to present a defense of oh yeah you know, demonic possession, and that was not allowed in court. And, mm. and there's, I'm sure, been others. Don't you think it's kind of interesting that the court can say like, no, you can't use that defense? That's not allowed in court. That's a weird thing to say. It's like technically uh, you can you can present whatever case you want. Yeah, yeah but you can't. I mean, that's which is why they're allowed to throw it out. I know, but it's Judges weird. Judges throw things out all the time. Yeah, I, it is weird, but I'm, I I do see the logic where if you didn't do that, it's like there's too many people that are just crazy. Like I picture like, okay, like a jury oh, of your send peers them off. with, you know, like, uh, well, there's so, okay, conspiracy theories are so mainstream now. Oh, God, are they ever? You could get somebody who is like, uh, okay, you could have like Tom Hanks accused of being like a satanic global global elite pedophile. And then you could get a jury of people who are like, yep, that's what I read on the internet. And they could define him guilty because those people are stupid. That's different. That's bringing charges against someone. That's, yeah, that is, that I is know different it wasn't than, the exact. Yeah, which which I think that judges should be able to throw things out like that. Mm-hmm. Like, that's fucking nonsense. But, but, okay, but in that same world, you could just do the defense okay. thing of, like, I had to do it because the lizard people made me. Right. Well, my concern is, and I don't yeah. know, I would need to talk to some legal expert about this, yeah. is I shoot you and I kill you. And <laughs> I say— Just an example. Well, just for simplicity. And then I say— the ghost told me to do it. And I go to court and I'm like, no, the ghost told me to do it. And then the judge is like, you can't, no, that's not okay. Then I would find myself making up another reason. So then you're just mm. lying about why you did it. Right. But I don't know if that's really like what they're saying or if that's how it works. Uh, I don't I, know. If, but if judges can arbitrarily say like, I don't like that defense. Mm-hmm. Try something else. <laughs> that's what I it feels like and he wasn't being told by a ghost he just thought the dude was a ghost right but then they wouldn't let which him which is pretty weird pretty open ended 
Like, yeah. whoops, I thought it was in- invisible. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, I see what you're saying. That would be a weird thing where that's not, yeah, you're not claiming that uh, a ghost made me do it. You're just claiming, right. like, hey, I thought this dude was a ghost. I thought you were a ghost. Kind of a, I mean. I thought you, yeah. You could probably let them use I thought use you were that. a ghost that leaves wet towels on the bed. <laughs> I, I would think you could use that, okay, you could use that defense, but then it's just never going to work. I just can't see. Right. Right. I don't I don't know. Who knows? Who knows what the what the laws were in 1804? I don't even know what they are now, please. I can't keep (laughs) up. All I know is that I'm never going to do anything that puts me on trial. I hope not. Me too. (laughs) You ready to uh, move from Britain to India? Uh, Yes, I am. This next one's really creepy. I like the way the story builds. Okay. Build it up, buttercup. Have you ever heard of a pishaka? Is that like a pashmina? I don't know what a pashmina is, so I don't know. Oh. What's a pashmina? It's like a wrap. It is not like a pashmina at all. Uh, A little bit of creepy setup, and then we'll dive in. I'll explain what it is. Uh, Every culture in the world has its own unique spin on the supernatural. Yes. Sorry, can I just say something? Sure. Um, My teeth look really funny. When you see it in the dark, it definitely looks like I'm missing two teeth. I'm in the middle of some dental work and have two teeth that are significantly a different color than the others. And I just saw my face up there. I'm like, oh, I look like I'm missing two teeth. Not right now, but when we're zoomed out, it is pretty funny. (laughs) Okay, every religion has their own demons or demonic equivalents, including Hinduism. From what I understand, the Hindu religion teaches and warns about three primary groups of evil entities or entities that can be can be evil. Uh, There are first the Bhuts, uh, B-H-U-T, also sometimes called uh, Bhutas. Uh, The Bhuts are supernatural creatures, often called ghosts. Uh, Usually they're described as being the spirit of a deceased person, often considered to be perturbed and restless due to some factor that prevents the spirit from moving on. Next, there are the pretas, eternally hungry, almost like a zombie-like entity. Mm. Uh, they're wandering, tortured souls of those who are false, corrupted, compulsive, deceitful, jealous, or greedy in life. These dark entities wander the earth at all times, generally unable to be seen, always miserable, always looking to feed. And then there are the pishakas, the worst of the dark spirits, demons, malevolent spirits that feed on human en- energy. Shapeshifters, they can take on human form at times. They can also possess humans' bodies and alter their thoughts. Their victims are afflicted with a variety of maladies, abnormal- abnormalities like insanity. Some say these demons can feast on human flesh, sap victims of their strength and life force. They can drain victims of their flesh and energy and kill them. They're most often encountered at burial grounds. It's extremely difficult to rid oneself of a pishaka. There are specific Hindu rituals kind of akin to like a Catholic exorcism. Okay. That, that one can hope and pray will work before it's too late. The Bishaka tends to prey on the weak or the young, but they can't attack anyone. Of course, most modern people think they are nothing more than folklore and superstition, but some still believe. I believe it. Some still claim uh, to be attacked by Pishakas. Time now for the tale of the friend that feeds. 19-year-old Ravi and his family moved to Mumbai in April of 2016. His father had gotten a new job that would hopefully see the family living a lot more comfortably. This would mean that his mother didn't have to take part-time work cleaning anymore and could focus on herself and her health and her family. She'd always been quite a frail woman, but her determination to make sure her family of three, Ravi's an only child, were happy and healthy was incredibly strong. Ravi was happy for his parents, whom he still lived with. He just began attending college and was not yet interested in the idea of marriage. He moved with his parents when his father got his new job, leaving behind their small village where he grew up and also leaving behind all the people he'd known for his entire life. His parents bought a new house on the outskirts of Mumbai. It was lovely. It was huge compared to where they'd lived before and also sat next to a charming little Hindu temple and cemetery. After they'd been in the house about a week, Ravi was feeling restless restless and and eager to get a better feel for their new neighborhood one evening. Unable to fall asleep, he decided to take a late night walk and explore their surroundings a little bit. He took a short walk into the cemetery. He'd always found cemeteries beautiful rather than frightening. He loved how quiet and still everything was at night. He didn't expect to encounter anyone this evening and was surprised to see a young man sitting on a bench. The man looked to be upset. Probably, of course, mourning someone. Being a naturally caring person, also slightly curious, Robbie sat down tentatively at the other end of the bench. You okay, man? He asked softly. Yeah, the man replied. I just lost a friend. It's, it, it's been a really hard week. The two men proceeded to talk for just short of an hour. Robbie let the young man, whose name he learned was Samir, get a lot off his chest. Samir was in pretty bad shape, gaunt and looking unwell. He was obviously having a hard time coping with the loss of his friend. Samir was the same age as Ravi, and he discovered was actually attending the same college. And he and Ravi promised to meet up the following morning. Ravi felt bad for the guy, but also 
happy to have maybe met his first friend in the city. Robert returned home and managed to get a decent night's sleep, despite waking up here and there due to some bad dreams he couldn't quite remember by the morning. He headed off to college that following morning and, as promised, met Samir before class. Samir looked like he had not slept as well as Ravi had. The young man grabbed breakfast and had more of a normal conversation. They found out they had a lot in common. The conversation went well enough for the two to agree to meet up for lunch that same day. At lunch, Ravi noticed that Samir was looking a little bit better. He seemed lighter, joked around, he was funny. Now the two agreed to meet up at the end of the day, chatting on a bench and on campus before heading home. Samir looked better still. He seemed to have a lot more energy. The companionship seemed to be really good for him. Once home, Ravi told his parents all about his new friend, who he realized throughout the course of the day was truly fascinating. He talked about him so much, his father joked he had a crush on his new friend. Exhausted now from his restless night the evening before, he headed off to bed early and passed out pretty quickly. Once more, he was plagued with bad dreams he couldn't quite remember the next morning. After another day spent either being in class, studying, or hanging out and chatting with Samir, he had another restless, troubled night. Soon it had been more than a week since Ravi had gotten a good night's sleep and his parents were starting to worry about him. He was starting to look pretty rough. He was pale. He looked like he was sick. But he said other than being tired, he felt fine. And he refused to take their advice and stay home from school and just rest for a day. Or maybe even visit a doctor. Instead, he headed off to college early every morning, afraid he'd miss a chance to hang with his new best friend before class. Samir was now doing great. He didn't speak at all anymore about the friend he'd lost. He seemed 100% past his grieving. He was upbeat, funny, cheerful. He was a blast to be around. Ravi decided he was truly the most fascinating person he'd ever met. He was smart, also an amazing athlete. The two would kick a soccer ball around and Samir was phenomenal. So good, Ravi thought he might even be able to play professionally. Ravi's parents continued to worry about him. He was now not only tired, he was losing weight. His eyes were constantly bloodshot. They drove him to their doctor and had blood tests ran for almost every ailment known to man. None of them pointed to any known sickness. His doctor was stumped. All he could do was ask Ravi to come back regularly for monitoring, watch his diet, make sure he tried to get some sleep. He prescribed him some sleeping pills. Ravi took them, or at least told his parents he took them, but he still didn't seem to sleep much. And now his parents were having a hard time sleeping as well. They began to notice strange things around their house. They started hearing scratching sounds coming from within the walls. They brought in pest control to check the house for rats and they found nothing. They also heard what sounded like someone banging on the windows at night, but they could never catch anyone doing it. They could never find evidence of anyone, say, sneaking up to the windows. Soon, Ravi's mother was also beginning to feel exhausted and weak all the time, just like her son. Then she claimed to start seeing things. She seemed to be suffering from hallucinations, believing she would see a man standing in the doorway of their new house out of the corner of her eye, only to look and watch him vanish when she tried to stare directly at him. Her husband was getting really worried about her. Meanwhile, Ravi had become irritable, snappy. He'd become mean, which was alarming. He'd always been friendly and a good-natured kid. His father was growing increasingly worried about both his wife and his son now. He watched his once respectful boy begin to fight with his mother who fought back, both hurling horrible insults at one another. Every day there was more yelling and tears. The atmosphere in the house had become insufferable. Still hoping that all this was due to prolonged lack of sleep, Ravi's father found the number of a well-respected sleep specialist in Delhi. He booked an appointment for his son, his wife refused to go, and didn't have the energy, and he didn't have the energy to fight with both her and his son. Ravi needed the appointment more anyway. He now had not slept properly in over a month and had lost a considerable amount of weight. The specialist, like the doctor before him, took a barrage of tests and once again determined nothing. He sent Ravi home with more, stronger sleeping pills in the hope that he could rest and that rest would fix everything. Thankfully, the pills did work. They knocked Ravi out and he slept. He slept for 14 to 16 hours at a time now. Wow. When he awoke, he unfortunately did not seem rested. Now, between how much he slept and how weak and unwell he felt when he was awake, he was unable to leave the house for college. And he was still haunted by dreams he couldn't remember. Then one night, he woke up his parents screaming for Samir in his sleep. When Samir came over to the house the next day to check on his friend, Ravi's father mentioned this to him, and he found it odd to see Samir flash a smug, satisfied smile on his face. He now started to wonder and worry about Samir. He didn't blame him for what was happening to his son and also his wife, but he did think about how his son was fine before he'd met Samir. Also, when Samir came over, his wife suddenly retreated to their bedroom and wouldn't come out. This was not like her. She told her husband that she didn't want Samir to come around anymore, but she wouldn't tell him why. 
Robbie's father explained that they couldn't just ban Samir from their home, not when their son was so excited to see him. He didn't want to deprive him of just about the only thing he currently looked forward to when his health was in such a precarious state. Then when he checked in on his son again a few minutes later, Ravi asked if Samir could stay the night. Ravi's father didn't like it. Neither, of course, did his wife, but again, he didn't want to disappoint or upset his son, so he agreed, and that night, the four of them ate dinner together. After dinner, Samir slept in the guest room, and the family were relieved when the usual knocking and scratching sounds they'd grown used to the past few weeks took a break for the night, the night their guest was there. Also, Ravi seemed to sleep peacefully through the night, no waking, screaming from any night terrors. But then after Samir left early the next morning before anyone else in the house was up, Ravi did not wake up. He appeared to be breathing just fine, but he didn't stir at all. Also, an odd odor now emanated from his room, the mild smell of sulfur. Ravi's personal hygiene had always been good. He kept his room impeccably clean. Neither of his parents could figure out where the smell was coming from. After breakfast passed and then lunch, Ravi was still asleep. His mom now decided to try to wake him up. She was glad he was getting so much sleep, but he surely he needed to eat, and then she couldn't wake him. Scared, she called her husband, who took the rest of the day off work. He also couldn't wake his son. Ravi had slipped into some kind of coma, and the smell of sulfur in his room had grown powerful, stronger as the day worn on. Ravi's father, not a particularly religious man, now felt drawn to look to religion instead of a doctor for answers. The doctors hadn't helped so far, and something in his gut told him that what was wrong with his son was something no doctor could fix. He decided to talk to the local pujari, the Hindu priest from the temple next door, and to try to get him to come over for a house visit. The pujari came over immediately. He quickly seemed to figure out what had happened. After hearing about how and where Ravi had met Samir and the changes that began to occur in Ravi almost immediately, after hearing about the scratching in the walls and the sounds of pounding on the windows and Ravi's mother also having trouble sleeping and feeling haunted by the image of a man she kept seeing out of the corners of her eyes, after smelling the sulfur himself, he told them that Samir had been, or that Samir was a Pishaka. Ravi's parents listened to the Pajari horrified as he explained to them that the Pishaka often takes the physical form of a person in order to gain the trust of their victim, but he can only present himself in that form for so long. The Pishaka in his natural spirit form had been in their home ever since that night in the cemetery. The scratching and knockings had been the result of his frustration being able to only feed a little at a time, the smell being what is left behind when the Pishaka enters Ravi's body in order to drain what life remains in him. He told them that they were to check at Ravi's school, they would find no record of Samir enrolled there. No one else would know him. Others certainly would have seen him with Ravi, but no one would have ever seen him alone, and now they would never see him in his physical form again. He also told them that they now didn't have much time to save their son's life. He estimated that their son would be dead in no more than three weeks' time unless they could flush out the evil, hungry spirit out of his body. They'd also have to bring in a doctor into their home or have him taken to the hospital to have fluids and nutrients pumped into his body so he didn't die from dehydration or malnutrition while they worked to get the evil entity out. He told them none of this would be easy. He said it would be extremely difficult to banish the spirit out of their home. They would have to perform a daily ritual and pray that it would send the Pishaka out of their son's body in time. They began the first ritual immediately, and suddenly they heard the loudest knockings and scratchings they'd heard so far. The foul odor intensified during the ritual, and Ravi groaned and writhed in his bed, but he did not wake up. Ravi's mother now felt like she couldn't get rid of the sight of the man now. He lurked constantly in the corners of her eyes. No matter where she turned her head, she could never fully see him, but she could also never fully get rid of him. Now Ravi's father felt like the man lurked around him as well. When the ritual was over, the sights and sounds went away, and Ravi stopped moaning and writhing. Only the smell of sulfur, sulfur remained. Ravi continued to sleep. The Pishaka had not left. They would try again tomorrow. And this is where the records of this story ends. No updates have since been posted. We may never know who won the race against time. Was the Pujari able to banish or destroy the Pishaka? Or did it destroy Ravi? And what about Ravi's mother? Is the Pishaka destroying her as well? That's it? Mm-hmm. Listen, I'm not the only one who's sick of your stories with no endings. <laughs> I, I, it Yikes. is a thing. We are frustrated with you, Dan. Who, who is we? Me and some of my spooky friends. Yikes. It's, it's, it's so upsetting. I need to know what happens to him. Well, this is a paranormal's mystery. You don't always get to know everything. No, I want to know if he makes it, if he doesn't make it, if they get it out. We don't know. That's what, what happens, somebody... That's what, what happens when they get out? What happens to uh, um, Samir? Does he just poof, disappear? If if they were to get out, yeah, you just never see him in that form again, is what I understand of like the lore. But in this particular example... That's that's all that's out there. And it's interesting that it could bounce from the son to the mom. 
before mm-hmm. she had before she ever met Samir, she was feeling the effects of it. Right, like the presence in their house somehow. This, yeah, yeah the, the the effects of this like supposedly demonic entity. Like it attached to the son, uh, Ravi, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then somehow left him and went to her, or was simultaneously actually. Yeah, attacking both of them, feeding on them. <sighs> There's a couple little uh, just illustrations. There's some uh, you know pretty cool ones. Uh, obviously, no pictures. Uh, but here's here's the first illustration of oh, Bishaka. Wow. I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. And I would not be happy if that thing came for me. <laughs> and then uh, this next one, I don't know how, I couldn't figure out how old it was by trying to like, you know, find the source of this Google image. It shows yeah. up in a few articles. I mean, but it looks like, you know, like a temple painting, like looks very old, possibly several centuries. Yeah. And then. Uh, it looks a little bit like you. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. me. Yeah. And, N- nice smile. Good hair. <laughs> oh, that's nice. And then one more. Uh, couldn't figure out who, uh, who this illustrator Sam Wood is. I tried to look into him. It says Sam Wood on the bottom. Looks like it was drawn in 2000. Just thought it was a cool sketch of someone's interpretation of the Pashaka. Yeah, that is real creepy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Uh, we haven't really explored much Hindu mythology. I think we have explored a tiny bit before, but I, I can't even remember exactly what it would have been. Uh, I cannot recall. Sorry. Mm-hmm. I cannot be helpful there. Uh... I would never go for a walk in a cemetery at night. Yeah. I, for I don't, like I don't for doubt peace that. and comfort. Even though like cemeteries by nature I find very, very interesting. Right. Mm-hmm. I love trying to find like the oldest grave. My dad and I do that. I'm gonna be in New Orleans with my dad soon. Like I'm so Oh yeah, ex- such cool cemeteries. Mm-hmm, like excited to take him to a couple cemeteries, all of that. But yeah. like uh, I just it it doesn't bring me comfort. It doesn't make me uneasy necessarily. I mean not during yeah. the day anyways. But the thought that he just like went for a walk, I'm going to just, you know, go for a stroll in the evening. And then to talk to a stranger in a cemetery in particular. Yeah. First of all, you won't find me engaging with strangers, generally speaking. Yeah. Although they tend to love me and to tell me their life stories. It's like some very special gift I have. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wouldn't sit down next to somebody at a cemetery because, of course, they're upset. Right. Like, I'm, And I, it just feels so private and intimate. And I'm not saying that Ravi... Deserved sure. what happened, but no, no, no. It's just like a weird, like, why'd you do that, man? Well, I, I would say if we're gonna go with the premise of this could be real, yeah. Then if this is this isn't a person sitting there, it's an enti- it's an entity that has some kind of you know basically like magical powers. Oh, like it drew him in, mm-hmm. and, oh. if, and if it could lure you over there, I mean that that's why it hangs out in cemeteries is to uh, find people, find, find new bodies to feed on, and so. I, I would guess. I would guess it had some yeah. special kind of charisma. It, ooh, very nice charisma. That's a ghost with a lot of charisma. Mm-hmm. Charismatic Funny. demon. <laughs> I just imagine them being like very suave now. Uh huh. Very. Uh, yeah, I, I've given them a whole vision of like some slimy guy who's like, "Check me out. I will suck you in." <laughs> um, yeah, that that was an interesting story for sure. For sure. I, I would be interested to explore other versions of that in the future. Okay, cool. So sorry, I had like a big cough. I don't know, like <laughs> earlier uh, when yeah. you were reading, I was like, so I have a, a little tickle in my throat oh, that no. does not want to go away. Oh, that's so annoying. I know, it's so annoying. And of course, was it there when uh, we weren't recording? Sure wasn't. Nope. The moment you sit down, mm-hmm. it is the most strange thing. Yeah, it's uncanny. It's like... It's like um, uh, <laughs> Like, like burping and I've worked with other people in a host it's like you'll be fine you'll have no indigestion oh, and yeah. then right before it's like your body gets like tense or something I think so right before you're going to record and it's like oh now I have a burp oh but why now oh, my, my two favorite things that happen mm-hmm. to me is one I will feel great oh mm-hmm. we have such a great mood high energy and then I sit down in this dark room and the yawns try to like mm-hmm. take it I'm like why <laughs> I'm not tired I woke up with so much energy I had coffee. Like, I don't understand. And then, yes, the um, like the indigestion is yeah. so real. I can feel my chest burning right now. This will be over. I'll stand up and it'll stop. Yeah, it's weird. So weird. I want to know the science behind that. Um, all right. Well, you ready for two great stories? I'm ready. You ready? Who you got? You got Layla? Mm-hmm, I got Layla. How's she smelling? Uh, she still has a little bit of uh, scent. Oh. A li- just a little bit. Mm-hmm. She's fading, but she but it's still there. I think we have a fresh Layla. I actually I know we do. Hmm. We'll, we'll have to uh, switch them out. I know. I just envision like taking all the Laylas and like tacking them to the wall. Yeah, because this is the third, so mm-hmm. we'd have yeah, be, be the fourth fourth one. Was she? It, were you calling her Trayla? Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I love this story. I thought it was an interesting way that I, how our fan Kylie like really set it up, and and she says right from the rip, like, listen, I know this story sounds crazy, and no one, no one, she says, no one has ever believed her, 
so I immediately was like, okay, is this going to be weird? And it's not, I, I thought it was going to be like some really crazy, far-fetched yeah. story. It's not. And I would say, Kylie, hopefully you're listening, I 100% believe that what happened. Okay. And we have like a little instance of possibly missing time, which is cool. a weird kind of thing to consider as another thing to be afraid of. It, it, it's, yeah, missing time is usually associated with um, uh, UFO abduction claims. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't exactly say that, but you think that like, definitely, mm -hmm. that that's what's going on here. So let's talk to Kylie and see where she lost some time. Hey, Dan and Lindsay, I'm Kylie, and my boyfriend and I catch the new STD every week and have been sucking for a few years now. Yes. I, lo I love that sentence alone. We've caught an STD and we're sucking. Like, <laughs> yep, for a few years. Hysterical. Let me start off by saying that I don't expect you to believe this story. No one I've ever told does believe me. I feel like a dork, actually, believing something like this happened to me. But whenever I think of it, I get goosebumps and can't reason myself into believing anything other than this happening. Like Dan always says, only one yeah. of these stories needs to be true. Surely they can't all be fake. Anyway, here's my story. I grew up on a farm in rural Iowa, the closest neighbor being about a half a mile away. The house that I, my parents, and four older brothers lived in was quite old. Fake wood paneling on the walls, a wood-burning fireplace as our source of heat in the winters, a carpeted bathroom, you get the gist. As kids, my brother and I were my brothers and I were pretty tight, aka I followed them around everywhere and pretended as if they liked me. We would all pile into the living room and have sleepovers and watch movies all night long. One night, I would have been about five or six, after all my brothers had fallen asleep, I laid there on the floor in my Dora the Explorer sleeping bag. My bedroom was adjacent to the living room, and that night my door was partially open. I couldn't take my eyes off the crack in the door opening to my room. I laid there and stared at it. After 20 minutes or so, I saw a figure come into view. It slowly came closer to my bedroom door, staring right back at me. Before I could get scared or cry or wake someone else, I blinked and it was morning. Could my eyes have been playing tricks on me? Sure. Was I lucid dreaming? Maybe. But what if I wasn't? What if I actually was awake like I always thought I had been? Now fast forward 12 years. My family eventually moved from that fa from that house on the farm and into town. I was walking home one night when I was about 17 years old after hanging out with a friend of mine. Living in a small farming community of 1,500 people, wandering around alone at night was never actually a concern for me. As I was walking home, I was talking on the phone with a friend that I had just left, and when I was a few blocks from my house, I heard an owl calling from a tree. Having seen the movie The Fourth Kind, I jokingly told my friend on the phone that the greys were after me. The closer I got to my house, the louder the hooting became. The quality of my phone call deteriorated and my phone screen, my phone screen turned white. The quality, oh sorry, uh, the screen was flickering off and on and my call dropped completely. I chalked it up to having shitty luck with phones, assuming it just needed a good charge. As I finally reached my block, my house being the only one on it, I was shocked to see the owl was in the tree next to my house. I had never seen an owl up close, nor had I ever seen one in any of the trees in my neighborhood. I cursed myself for planting the ideas of extraterrestrials in my own head. Without the comfort of a friend, I was a little bit creeped out. I went inside to find out my parents were at the local bar, unsurprising as they were avid drinkers, meaning I was alone for the night. I plugged my phone into charge, and to my, and to my relief, it turned on. Just as it was booting up, the flickering started again, and my phone eventually turned off entirely. I decided that this was a sign I should call it quits for the night, and I headed to bed. The next morning, my mom was strangely distant with me. Finally, she asked me where I had been the previous night, in a tone that suggested that I had been caught red-handed. Me, being totally confused, having been home promptly at my curfew, asked her what was she talking about. She told me that when she and my stepdad came home from the bar the previous night at about 2 a.m., my door was open, and I wasn't in bed, and I uh. wasn't home. The one time I didn't actually sneak out, my mom thought she had caught me sneaking out. Unsurprisingly, she did not believe me when I told her I hadn't gone anywhere. I pleaded with her to believe me. I was terrified. What if it happened again? What if it happened again and I didn't come back? 
What if it wasn't supernatural and someone actually took me from my own home? I have tried to reason with myself to come up with conclusions as to what happened. I've played devil's advocate for years, but I can never come up with an answer. Where was I that night? What happened to me? After typing all of this out and rereading it, I feel crazy for even sending this in. I even called my mom today to reaffirm that this did happen just five years ago, and I didn't imagine it or see it in a movie. She remembers, but she still doesn't believe me. I'm reaching out to you guys in hopes that someone does. Kylie. Kylie, that's interesting. Just Mm -hmm. that your dad would, you know, check out your room and find you not there on a night that you definitely remember being there. Yeah, her mom, but yes. Oh, I thought it was the dad that checked. No, her mom and stepdad, and then in the morning, she had the encounter with her mom. Oh, okay. Whatever, parental unit. (laughs) Parental person checked. Um, Yeah, that would mess, I mean, that would mess with my head, too. If, like, my, you know, anybody accused me of sneaking out on a night when I was in bed the whole night. Just think about it this way. Mm Mm-hmm. I, you're in the studio still working. Yeah. Okay. You're not at home. I'm at home. I say like, Hey, I'm going to bed. Good night. Mm-hmm. Love you. Whatever. And then you come home and I'm not fucking there. I'm not there. <laughs> right. And then the, I'm assuming the next... they did, she doesn't go into the details, but I would have to imagine, um, Kylie had a cell phone. So I would imagine that her mom called her mm-hmm. like, like, Hey, like looking for her thinking like, God, where's my kid. Right. right? Unable to get a hold of her because the phone was acting up and had died. Yeah. yeah. And so then, well, I guess maybe the phone was plugged in. So maybe the mom saw the phone and thought like, oh, stupid. Kylie snuck out without her phone. Right, right, right. Can't track her down. Yeah. So you come home. My phone's on my bedside charger. I'm missing. I mean, I would go into a full fucking panic. Right. And this was a while ago in like a small Small farm Small town, town. different She probably just figured, oh, Kylie fell asleep at her friend's house and didn't come home. And if she knew that her daughter was kind of like sneaking out before, which she alluded to, yes, not going to set off the same kind of alarm Mm -hmm. bells. It's just going to like, I'm going to deal with this tomorrow. Right. But then you, and then the parent, you get up Mm -hmm. and you see the kid and you think like, oh, okay, you came home and you thought I wouldn't know. But meanwhile, Kylie, it's like, holy shit. (laughs) You went to sleep and then you woke up. And, but like you like things were not right, right? And, and if she would have got up to use like the bathroom, you'd think in this situation they would have figured that out. They would have figured that out. If she's like looking, you know, for her daughter at night, yeah, no, that's super strange. And that, and, and I mean, that is part of the lore of extraterrestrial abduction stories is that they, you know, on their end they lose time, right? But like what happens to them, you know, theoretically in the real world is they just they're just gone for a little while. You know, like they're taken somewhere. Yeah, they're studied, whatever, for however long, and then right. plot back on Earth, and uh, you know, in their in their mind, just based on like you know testimonies or whatever stories, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. they're like, oh, just like a minute passed, or maybe I blacked out for a second, right? Or, but then they look at the clock, or like they're in the car, and all of a sudden, like they look, you know, some see a weird flashing light, something happens, they look back at the little uh, the clock, and it's four hours forwards. Yeah. Because they weren't there those four. So that's, that's interesting to think. I've never really thought about it from that angle of like if you went up and saw their car during their time lapse that you would just see the car with nobody inside of it. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, and from their perspective, they're sitting there one second. They think they're sitting there the next second, but they just been plopped back in that position. So for right. her, Kylie. For everyone like, around them. Mm-hmm, Kylie like lays in bed, yeah. wakes up in bed. Yeah, she didn't even know that she went missing. <laughs> right. That is fucking terrifying because I can imagine – as a teenager, as a partner, whatever, yeah. it's like, no, I was here all night. No, you weren't. It's like, yes, I fucking was. Can you imagine yeah. the kind of fight? Right. Right? And like, you know, if it was my mom, I would have been grounded. I would have been in so much trouble. I would have been in more trouble for lying about, not not telling the truth about sneaking out. Like, it's an interesting oh my thought God, it's so weird. Where if you're some kind of crafty alien and for whatever reason, you just do not want to get caught <laughs> experimenting on people. Because I've always, you know, wondered about that angle. Like, yeah. like why do they care? But, it, right. but but if there is a reason for them to care about not wanting to get caught, I mean, that's kind of the perfect thing just to go and just plop people out of their beds at night, do what you need to do with them, and then plop them back in their bed before the next morning. And I guess with a couple in that situation, theoretically, like you could take both people. Yeah. So maybe you've already been abducted several times. Maybe sometimes when you maybe when you think you've had trouble sleeping, it's because you've been uh, probed and studied in some spaceship. And I guess you came with me because you didn't notice I was missing. Mm, I probably sat in the lobby, <laughs> just like waited, like read a magazine or something, waited for them to be done. How weird would that be, actually, if couples were being abducted together? And then, <laughs> yeah, because then no one would right. know you were no missing. One would, no one would know. Oh or my you, god! Or if you live alone, they could just get you every night. So for anybody listening, living alone, like they probably get you. But most nights, if I, if I had to guess, I would have to guess that most of our listeners, that's terrible. most of the time when you're sleeping, they're probably 
they're they're examining you. They're sticking things in your butt. What? That's what they do. And they do not stick things in your butt. That's how their tools work. They're not all perverts like you. It's not. It's not sexual. For when it's just like that's where the probe goes to examine your organs the best. I love how you immediately go to booty action. That's not me. That's (laughs) alien lore. Oh boy. (laughs) Such a convenient hole. <laughs> right? No, so the, if you put it on the human, like back to the, let's get the ETs out. Okay. Just like the scariness of, let's say you slept walk out of Ooh. your house oh, and just cruised suck. around God. your yard and never woke up and just walked yourself back in. Oh my you never God. Left. I didn't even that think of that as an so option. Scary. Oh my yeah. God, that's so scary. Yeah. Well, that's like people who have had accidents sleepwalking. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's been there's been numerous. Inc- I'm sure there's been people who have died on accident, but there definitely have been people who have like walked off a balcony and badly injured themselves, and they were just completely asleep when God it happened. Bless my goodness. Yeah, I, I never thought of, I never thought about how far you could go sleepwalking. Mm-hmm. That's scary to like walk out in the woods middle of the night. I. It's crazy to think that you could like unlock your door. Right, you're not just like it's yeah. not like you're just getting up and walking. You uh, are performing tasks that take, you know, uh, what is it? Um, fine motor skills. Right. New scary thought. There's yes. some kind of demonic entity situation like out in the woods, and it like lures you out during your sleep to, that's, that's, to do things to you. That's whoa. You mm-hmm. just go missing. Uh. That would be crazy if you went to sleep and something possessed you mm-hmm. and got you to walk yourself <sighs> to the woods and then poof. And then like crawl into some little tiny cave underneath some tree and that's where it feasts. And then you're gone. Mm-hmm. And what would be crazy is that no one would know where you were. Mm-hmm. They would eventually like have an investigation. They would see, you know, maybe you on like your ring doorbell walking right. out and then CCTV there's imagery of you yeah. going to the woods and then you're just gone. They lose your scent. They like that you're everything stops at this cave. Ugh. Wow. And we're not gonna watch it here, but there's such a funny video. This guy uploads uh videos of his wife sleepwalking around their like living oh, room. Oh funny. And like taking pickles out of the fridge and putting them <laughs> in the front yard. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of that. I, it's really, it's really funny. That's I haven't really seen it in funny. a while, but if you are interested, uh, they should look that up. It's, it's really, it's funny. Okay, cool. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Okay, bye. That is funny. Um, okay, are you ready for one more? I am. How do you feel about psychics? Um, you know, I mean, in, in general, I'm like, I think most of them are con artists. Uh huh. But on this show, trying to expand my brain a little bit, I'm open to the possibility of people knowing things. I, I just find in my experience when I look into supposed psychics on the web, my bullshit meter usually goes way off. Have you ever been like, to a psychic? No, I've just, I've never had any interest. So mm-hmm. I guess I don't have a, a very strong belief in that stuff. Okay. Uh, Cause I would assume that, uh, I mean, again, some be, some people could have that gift. I'm not saying that, but like when I've looked into it and people who have worked with the police departments and things in general, I tend to think they're full of shit. Do you feel like the things that they say are just generalized? Yeah, it's, it's like a medium who does like cold readings. Mm-hmm. Like those people usually just disgust me when it's, it's, it's like they play this stupid little game of like, oh, I'm, I'm picking up on somebody's elderly. It's like a father. And then they can like read people's body language and somebody perks up mm-hmm. and then they zero in on that person like a, like a male, like a female. And then they perk up again, an elderly female energy. Uh, your grandma may have passed. And then like they, they just know how to play this game. Right. With bouncing around. And then when they make mistakes, it's, it's crazy to watch like John Edwards and those people. <laughs> Yeah, they they actually make tons of mistakes, yeah. but they move on from them so fast that we like your grandma and uh, your aunt. Like they just switch it. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, you just guessed a million fucking things, right? And you let their body language tell you when you had a hit, mm-hmm. and you just pursue the hits. I'm like, that's not spiritual. That's just you being a straight up yeah. con artist. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm I am just hesitant of, off of a. Uh, who I consider to be grief profiteers. Okay, okay, that is fair. People who prey on others' desperation. I don't think that psychic medium, that those people, that I don't think it always has anything to do with people. It doesn't always have anything to do with the loss of someone. No, I went to mediums from yeah. psychics. But but and then psychics in general, I sometimes think they also prey on desperation where somebody comes to them like really I really need some good hmm. you know, uh a future vision. Okay. I, I will say yeah. I have seen a psychic multiple yeah, yeah. times. I haven't seen a psychic since we started dating. And I, I thought you did with Randy. No, Randy wanted to go see a medium. One of my best friends lost oh. her dad very unexpectedly. And it was like a group setting like that. Got it. We drove to Seattle and back in a day. Mm. And I went, I was like, of course, I will go with you. Yeah. She just felt like 
there were some things happening since her dad passed and it was just like bothering her, right? Yeah. Of course, she was like sure, upset, sure. searching for anything. And yep. we went and we were 10 minutes in and we were like, this guy's a fucking wackadoodle. Okay. Okay. So we weren't like yeah. all in, but I have seen a psychic individually myself multiple times in my life. Mm-hmm. I haven't gone since we met because when I went, I wasn't looking for like, oh, tell me the future. It was just like, I was in a tricky situation, and mm-hmm. but I hadn't seen this psychic before, and yeah. I gave no information prior to. And I get yeah. it. Like, they could have concocted the whole thing, but it... It felt real. It felt real, and there were things that were said that I'm like, there's no fucking way that okay. you could know that particular detail. Yeah, and, and again, I can't know that it doesn't work. I'm, right. I'm, I'm just skeptical. Okay. Uh, but I'm skeptical of all these things. Sure, okay. You know, yeah, but I, but, I, but I also want them to be true. All right. And so if I had an experience like that and it resonated with me, I'd be like, okay, that'd be more open to, and, and I am open to believing that that power exists. Sure. I guess, yeah, I did, the last time I saw Psychic, I did want it to be true because I was dating somebody, Mm -hmm. there was somebody in my past that was lurking around, and I hadn't met you yet. Yeah. And she very specifically said to me, because I I did want to know, like, what was going on with this relationship. Sure. And she said, like, well, there's this guy that you're with right now, but there is is someone from your past kind of, like, popping back up, Mm -hmm. which you could say about, like, any dating, sure, I get Mm -hmm. that. Common, yeah. Yep. But... Well, I think what most people want to hear is like, no, you're in the right place. You're with the right guy. And she was like, hate to tell you this. Yeah. This is not it. There's, there's, a, there's a third player. and Because she, she said, like, who's the third person? Mm-hmm. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And within weeks, I met you. Who's this, who's this mysterious player? You. It was mm-hmm. you. And so she said, the third player, that is your person. Yeah. And it worked out. Right. So I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Okay. All right. Well. With all that skepticism from you and openness from me, let's dive into this next story. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Hey, Dan and Lindsay, I don't want to type too much, so I'll just keep my intro short. I'm a listener of Time Suck and have been listening to this new show for about a week. I've been dying to send in a story to you two. Awesome. Back when I was a senior in high school, class of 2007, my mother and I began to discuss my little brother's night terrors. I brought it up because they had suddenly stopped about three months ago. My brother, Nate, had had night terrors for years since he was a toddler. Nate would scream, and every once in a while, he would run out of his room, never remembering any of this the following morning. I shared with my mother a story I had never told anyone. One night, I was babysitting Nate while our folks were out on the town. It was 2 a.m., and I was still up watching TV when Nate began to scream from his room, like a blood-curdling scream. I ran to his room to find him sitting up, staring straight ahead towards the foot of his bed. Relieved that he wasn't going to take off running, I sat on the side of his bed, placed my hands on Nate's shoulders. I began shaking him, yelling, wake up! I had never experienced this by myself and had never been to one to handle it directly. Nate stopped yelling, but he still seemed fixated on something. I leaned over to make eye contact with him, but Nate leaned to the side to continue looking beyond me. Then Nate said the most terrifying thing imaginable. He's right behind you. Uh. I felt chills, not only from the cold temperature that I was just realizing had filled the room, but also the fact that I did feel the presence of someone behind me. I knew I had to turn around and look, but I didn't want to. Ever so slowly turning around, I saw nothing. I then turned around to find Nate limp in my arms, passed out. After telling my mother this story, she turned white, covered her mouth with both hands, her eyes wider than I was anticipating, and she said something. She said, I have to tell you a story. About three months ago, Nate's night terrors suddenly stopped while my mom was visiting her parents in Nebraska. She left us kids and our dad home because apparently when we go there, we complain too much. My grandparents live in a town so small that everyone knows everyone, but they had a new neighbor in town. She was a non-Christian, non-white, non-Republican. This was the normal kind of individual you find here. She was a fortune teller, palm reader, medium of sorts. Honestly, they're so old-fashioned that they basically just called her a gypsy. You have to meet her, my grandmother said. So they decided to pay her a visit. My mother explained that this fortune teller explained this fortune... My mother explained this fortune teller as being very energetic and a joyful person. After having a long conversation, the palm reader asked if my mother had any pictures of her kids. My mom had a school photo of me and one of Nate that was of him standing at the foot of his bed. The medium took the picture of Nate and said, who's that man behind him? My mother was confused because, of course, there was no one else in the picture. 
The gypsy then told my mom, well, I can tell you who it is if you're willing to pay. <laughs> my mother, being more curious than concerned about, uh, was, my mother, being more curious than concerned, agreed to compensate the lady. This woman and my mom sat in a, at a table in a back room, tapestries covering the walls. They held hands and the woman began to request the man in the picture come to speak with her. After many chants and requests, the gypsy then said, he has agreed to speak with us. After many questions, the man was identified as being a family friend from our dad's side who had died a decade ago on the I-25 ramp heading east to Highway 34. A year after, on this anniversary, this man's son died in a crash on the exact same ramp. That was the same year that Nate was born. The ghost's body was buried on our family's property, and Nate had been visiting the family campground since he was born. The gypsy then informed us that this ghost that Nate the gypsy then informed us that the ghost was not was Nate and not his son and had already passed to the other side. Then it was over and the woman explains to my mom that he now knows Nate is not his son. My mother, being skeptical, paid the woman and was not amused. My mother returned home later that day. And the next day my mother awoke to Nate standing next to her bed, creepy in its own right. Nate said Everything's going to be okay, Mom. My mother, not exactly sure what Nate was talking about, half asleep, then got out of bed grabbing a robe and headed to Nate's room to follow up with him about what he had just said to her. She headed to Nate's room, opened the door, only to find Nate dead asleep. She woke Nate up and asked him what he had just said to her in her bedroom. But Nate said, Mom, I wasn't in your room. Weird. Weird. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I don't know what to make of all that. <laughs> it's like a bizarre... Because mm -hmm. it's like, if you if you go the angle that like the psychic is full of shit, mm -hmm. right? Like, let's just take it that way. A psychic could look at any photo and say, oh, who's that person? And then do what you said, like probe, 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 probe. Right. But no one knew that she saw the psychic other than like, you know, her parents or whatever. So if she comes home and doesn't tell her kids this story, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then for Nate to come back... And to, or for Nate to come to her room and one night. And say that, what, what do you say, it's going to be Everything's okay? Everything's going to be okay, Mom. Right. It's like, that is weird. And then, and the night terrors stopped. So, like, in my mind, what I think was happening is that... Yeah. The, the family friend who passed away, his son dies, and he hasn't been able to find his son and the other side. Maybe mm -hmm. his son hasn't fully passed. Maybe he's, like, hanging out in the ether. Like, we don't know exactly where he is. But that family friend is looking over Nate. Like, because it, it, it doesn't ever sound like it was anything that Nate was scared of. I mean, he had yeah. night terrors. It's, so like, a weird combination of things. But if he was, like, you know, I'm thinking about him popping up in bed, staring at the foot of his bed, staring at someone, something. Mm -hmm. And then that eventually just stops after, right after the mom sees a psychic and Nate says, like, everything's going to be okay. Did that ghost realize because the medium told him or the gypsy or whatever you want to call her, um, she told the ghost, like, this is not your son. Nate is not your son, that he moved on. And so now the night terrors are over and Nate and everyone are okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a weird coincidence at the very least. Yeah. The timing of it is incredibly strange that it would happen as, as, as it happened. I am for it. Yeah. I believe it. I do believe. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't think that all people have that ability, but, you know, uh, you know, I have friends who claim that ability and there will just be moments where things just feel different when I'm with them. And I'm like, okay, something strange is happening right now. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And like, like I'm open to, you know, numerous other things we've talked about here. So I don't know why I draw a hard line, you know, in this specific area. So yeah, I'm, I'm open to, I mean, there, yeah, so, something weird. But I don't, yeah. I'm just, I can't process it and articulate it right now. I'm not going to be able to, but something <laughs> okay. weird happened there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to be defensive about it. It's okay. <laughs> Oof. Um, okay. So do you want to do some Annabelle shout outs? Yes, I do. Do you want to start or do you want me to start? I'll start. Okay. You can go first. Yeah, I'd like to uh, thank the following Annabelles. Uh, yeah, thank you for supporting our show. Natasha Marble, Logan Reisner, Marvin Bradley, Aaron uh, Heidebrecht, Hudson Wonderland, uh, or Wonderland, Bob Menzel, CCCMMM, okay, Who triple knows? C, triple M, uh, Michelle Jeffries, Jamie Green, Heather Barub, Wendy Lesson, Shauna. Keegan Kirkland, Rachel Todd, Kate Cooper Martin. 
Good job. <laughs> I would like to thank the following Annabelles for supporting our show. Erica, the musician. Catherine White. Cassie, no last name given. Madison Williams. Nicole Bortz. Alyssa Peters. Coley. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Cole, the, the furry. <laughs> Kelsey Carling. Saulo Ortega. Alexander Nelson. Chrislyn Perkins. Brittany Dumas. Alexander Clout. And Aaron and Haley Stephenson. Nice. Look at that. I think we got those those names out today. I, I think we did all right. Could I do some spooby shout outs? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, I have some spooby shout outs to Beth from Ryan. Happy birthday. And I hope camping is awesome. They are camping for Beth's birthday. I'll say it in both ways. In the Appalachian Mountains and the Appalachian Mountains, like whatever, however you guys Sure, I know. The, the big right. tomato tomato debate there. Oh, boy. It is funny how people get worked up. I mean. That one word in particular. I know it. After this episode, I yeah. look at emails from both sides. I grew up there. This is how you say it. I grew up there. This. This is how you say it. I'm like, guys, I can't fucking get it right. I think it's funny how people can see, just can't see outside of themselves, some people in certain situations. I think about, I was thinking about the same, similar, very similar thing this morning in the shower about how like, uh, this is random, but I was, for me, and I'm not going to really delve in, so don't worry, listeners, but I was thinking about politics and it's funny how, you know, I, I put a, a viewpoint out mm -hmm. about anything. I don't even think it's political, let's say on Time Suck. Okay. And you will get some people who are like, you'll get the same tone of email like, huh, okay, buddy, uh, normally like you, but you're pretty ignorant here. And then they'll they'll you know give this kind of lecture of this is how it really is mm -hmm. and then somebody else will have the same tone of email this is how it really is and they're two completely contrasting right. viewpoints and it's just so funny there's just so many people that are so self-assured of like this is how everything is always mm -hmm. and it's like no it's not Right. There's you know, variation it, and nuance to everything. Yep, they're really, and even with that word, it's just such a simple example because mm -hmm. I've gotten them too from Time Psych episodes. Oh, yeah. That particular word really that particular sets word It's like, I've, I've grown up here my whole life. This is how you say it. No, that's how you say it. And right. that's how others around you have said it. Right. And I assure you, we get emails from other the other side being like, oh, I've lived here my whole life and you guys nailed it. I know. It's, it's funny. Just, but it's just funny. It's like, that people can't be like, yeah, that's how some people, and that's just, in general in life, that's what some people believe. Right. That's what some people feel strongly about in this situation. That's what some people, how some people choose to say this word. I know. Monroe, it's a funny I, personality I would say thing. comfortable. Like, mm -hmm. oh, this shirt is so comfortable. And yeah. she's like, do you mean comfortable? And she like would not let it go. So now I'm like, uh, when I'm around her, I'm so cognizant. If I am to say the word comfortable, comfort, comfort. Oh, com funny. It's like, it messes with my fucking brain. Cause I'm like, well, it is actually comfortable. Like yeah. that is the word, but like comfortable. Com right. I can't. It's a, it's a weird thing. Cause I get where if you just don't care about any of that stuff, then things fall into anarchy. Like right. we have to have right. some, we have, we have to have some agreed upon. Like I get it. I get yeah. it. That. But it is funny. It's like, um, in life, I always think there's all these unwritten rules mm -hmm. and some people just get them. And some people don't. And to the people that don't, you just can't explain why X right. doesn't matter and Y does. Right. Yeah, you just can't satisfy them. Yeah. Can I get back into my shout outs? Sure, sure can. Okay. <laughs> Two, I, I knew I was asking for it with that one. No, it, I just happened to be thinking about it this morning. Yeah, That's something okay. similar. To Casey from Davey, I love yeah. you and you got this. To Gage from Colette, happy first Father's Day. Come on, that's so cute. That is cute. To Paul and Matt from Izzy and Hannah. Okay, now listen. I'm supposed to do something, but you cannot see me from the waist down. They have this little game. Huh. They're doing okay. this game. Do you know that game? Um, mm, I don't think okay, I do I'll know that game. I'll explain to you later. Okay. <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. And to Carter from Caden. Oh, yeah, this is so cute. The um, to Carter from Caden, they're like two younger fans, uh, and they just love like listening to the show and sharing yeah. the spoops together. I mean, I, I think love that they're it. like twelve or thirteen. That's such a fun age for oh, horror. For horror specifically, it's the best. It's the best. That's when I first got into it. Mm -hmm. That's when I first started. Like you feel like uh, so cool to like start staying up late. I mean, it's different now where things stream. Mm -hmm. When I was, you know, uh, that age, you did, you couldn't just. Um, find your most horror movies at like two o'clock in the afternoon or right, whatever. Right. You couldn't find a variety. You had to wait until like after midnight and that's when Showtime and Cinemax, if you had those channels, that's when they'd start running their like pulp horror kind of movies. Oh, and man, oh, you are old. we couldn't, we couldn't wait. Cause Tales I, from the Crypt. Yes. <laughs> that was, that was the mm -hmm. one when I was a kid. Yep. I, I, that, means, that means I made it. Yeah. The Crypt Keeper? I made it to 9 p.m. <laughs> I did it. That's awesome. Well, I didn't have any of that because we didn't have cable. Yeah. So, and so, but we would go to Blockbuster. Like it was like mm -hmm. me, Sarah, Amanda, Patty, Megan. We had this whole crew. VHS and we would, horror. Yep. 
somebody would go and get and it was like you know some parents like wouldn't let you get it because it was rated r and yeah. like you know so certain households you could get away with it other households you couldn't i oh. still remember some of the um uh, the ones my mom wouldn't ever let me get yeah and just like the vhs covers i yeah. think they're, i think the movie is called house and it's like a decapitated rotting hand pointing towards a doorbell and then like with a house you know like in the background spooky but i just remember like always seeing that and be like come on, come on mom, please. let me watch it yeah i remember the friday the 13th covers oh yeah yeah uh, thanks for the ratings and reviews lately, Creeps and Peepers. Uh, they help us find new listeners, are so appreciated, and we appreciate that you're still doing that. You guys are so nice. And that's all for today. Um, thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else at info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Uh, thanks to Logan Keith working on social media, badmagicmerch.com, uh, merch design. And thanks to producer Sophie Evans for the first story, the Hammersmith story, uh, for finding that and getting me started on that. And thanks to your producer, Sarah Finch, for getting me started on the second Pishaka story. Nice. Uh, thanks to Joe Paisley for producing and directing today and to Zach Cohen for custom sound bed creation. And thanks to Heather Rylander for continuing to organize the My Story emails. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want more content, want to see the pics associated with each show, at Scared to Death Podcast. And you can find our private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, for horror lovers. Thanks to Liz Hernandez and her all-seeing eyes for moderating. And it's just called Creeps and Peepers. I feel like I make it sound like the title is Creeps and Peepers for Horror Lovers. Oh. <laughs> uh, subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you want to see the show and others. And if you don't want to hear more ads, if you want monthly bonus content, uh, check out our Patreon. Enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Thank you for listening. Hope you were scared to death. Bye, guys. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions.